This episode of the Cold Popcha podcast was brought to you by our Patreon. If you want to tell us which films we should watch, get up to two extra exclusive podcasts a month, give us something to talk about in the post credit scenes at the end of each episode, or even contribute to the discussion in the episode itself, then please consider joining the cult and donating at www.patreon.com slash cultpopture. And welcome everybody to the Cult Pop Show podcast. This is, of course, your favourite uh, New Zealand movie-based podcast. I think I don't know how many there are, and maybe that's an obnoxious thing to claim. But here we are. You are joined as usual by myself, AJ, and uh, my my bestest friend in the whole universe, Richard. You sound hey, Richard. like you're talking about this podcast more than you normally would, almost mm. as if you have someone you're trying to impress. I'm trying to impress my other bestest friend in the whole world. We have joining us today for what is actually the first guest to, we've ever had on a non-film franchise Fortnite's episode who wasn't being interviewed. Uh, we have Ben Johnson from the fantastic YouTube channel Centro. Hello, Ben. Hey guys, happy to be here. I'm very honored to be your first guest with a lot of caveats. Mm. <laughs> Don't like fuck a, it up. A, <laughs> um what's fun about this as well is that the three of us look like we would belong in the same police lineup like if if someone who looked like us committed a crime we would all be pulled in for questioning i think we're all uh bearded bespectacled young men mm. um, not only so that's- can no one else see that but you're not even wearing your spectacles well, that's why I said, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I thought I could say it, because no one could see I wasn't. Oh, um, man. It's, it's like, no, it's the one with the, the receding hairline. No, the other one with the receding hairline. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So we have, um, we, we have brought you on today, Ben, because we're going to talk about a specific topic today, which um, I had seen you discussing on Twitter um irrespective of knowing that we wanted to talk about it um and so i was like well we should get ben on because he's got some great ideas and i'm sure he would be able to um weave some interesting um concepts through this episode so uh inspired by the recent release of the movie prey uh which is a I, it's like it's technically a prequel to predator but it's more like it's a predator period piece um set in the oh, i think of like the 1700s american frontier uh follows some comanche um natives as they battle the onslaught of a predator um and this is such an intriguing concept to me and for all those tweets out there now saying like this is the the format this is the blueprint that horror movies should be following i just want to say we've been saying this for years mm-hmm. you can look back you can go back to i reckon 2018 was the mo the the last time in recent memory i remember pitching that or, or not even pitching just suggesting that these horror movie franchises um should that are that are all flailing that are all like <laughs> desperate to try and get their next big hit should just start doing period pieces um and so we've expanded that to not just horror movies but any movie um we asked a bunch of you guys listening we asked on the discord and twitter um <clears throat> for essentially period piece prequel pictures pa, 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 pa. um and so we're going to go through some today and we're going to um go through our own we've each got we've each prepared one each and we'll read out the suggestions from our listeners as well it is worth saying that prey is not the only film the only period piece prequel that exists currently uh, off the top of my head uh the king's man recently mm. is a world war one set kingsman prequel um and i was also made aware on from the discord that tremors for the legend begins is a wild west tremors movie which is a, a great oh. idea <laughs> um and uh far cry primal the video game mm. is essentially the far cry template in stone age times which yeah. is a really cool idea that they should do more of i think <laughs> but yeah even not necessarily going back so far but you know things like bumblebee is like a mm. transformers prequel set True. in like the 80s and yeah um, yeah uh, x-men first class as well 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yep. Um, and so with with the the uh, catch of of comments we got, some people I think didn't quite understand what <laughs> what we were asking. And I think the important thing is is that it's emphasizing the period piece aspect over the prequel aspect it is because some people were just pitching prequels but it's like no no what we're saying is like what happens when you take a familiar concept or story and transpose it into a different time period what does that look like um so i thought we'd begin today with uh discussing um uh pyramid on the discord uh said a prequel to toy story set during the very early man that tells the story of the very first toy that ever existed um this was yes anded by a bit more fermented teat nectar on um discord who said i'm also thinking of a victorian age toy story where all they had were like lead soldiers who steadily watched their masters go insane to lead due to lead poisoning they'd be up to all sorts of hijinks trying to save the day but really the issue was themselves and uh common Kazi Jeff on Twitter also suggested Toy Story, but they're all qu- creepy Victorian dolls. What do you guys think of this? This like these Toy Stories from different time periods. Uh, I like that first one because I'm just picturing the rocks from mm. Everything Everywhere <laughs> all at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with the googly eyes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's definitely like yeah, the Victorian dolls and stuff like that. And it's one of those things I could see them doing like a Disney Plus short or something one day that's like mm. uh, some like a toy owned by royalty that's been passed down from generations mm. and all the things that this toy would have seen. Mm. Totally. Um, I think what, it, what appeals to me about this idea as well is that um, – we before toy story 4 came out we had discussed on the podcast like what actually makes the toys alive like because like bo peep is a lamp a lampshade and she's alive you know Mm. so like what's the deal there and then that was sort of answered with forky in toy story 4 and so with with the rocks like the everything everywhere all at once thing it's like i guess if a caveman child a cave child thinks it's a toy then it it would be alive mm. <laughs> it's, it's it's granting sentience to to rocks um so yeah no fun idea richard do you want to read out the next one uh the almighty watcher on discord said the thing but it takes place in the jurassic era and the dinosaurs can talk so like a non-animated <laughs> land before time with a shape-shifting alien killing a bunch of dinosaurs i don't know if i can get behind them talking but i like a jurassic set thing movie I, I yeah I, I think if you had that movie and they can't talk and you just make it like almost like a like a homeward bound kind of thing except mm. they could talk on that but just like just just a, a bunch of dinosaurs film. yeah like looking really confused and sad like <laughs> like primal um yeah, when yeah. you know the mom dinosaur is actually an alien and it kills the, <laughs> the baby dinosaur yeah no that'd be that'd be super interesting i has, has there ever been something like that where it's just like a movie set in a time period where just no one can talk because i feel like that's such a risky move that hollywood wouldn't want to Mm. to get behind (laughs) um Mm. dante on the discord also said uh transformers set during the stone age they can transform into the flintstones little car and at uther lives on um on twitter said would transformers like they're friends with vikings or whatever and like i think this is relevant because the the second the four and five transformers four and five did dabble in mm. period piece there was yeah. the age of extinction like had a brief scene set in the dinosaur times and uh the last night had a brief scene set in medieval times and, well, and also both, like and they killed a yeah. uh, transformer killed hitler as well Oh, true. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. That, that. that was like the only reason I wanted to see that movie. Like I stopped watching the Transformers movies at like two. Uh, mm. But then I saw this trailer where like King Arthur was hanging out with uh, mm. Optimus Prime. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. I might need that. <laughs> and I think, I think those are the, the, in four and five anyway, those are certainly the best scenes of the movie. And, and like, I remember the medieval scene and, and Transformers last night and being like, oh my god make the whole movie this obviously make the whole movie that's not the best scene in the last night you don't reckon that that scene was shit the best (laughs) scene is the best scene is when anthony hopkins gets on the submarine and tells everyone to get off and his eyes just like pop out of his head and he's like get out get out (laughs) (laughs) well maybe i'm confusing it with the dinosaur scene from um, Mm. age of extinction or maybe they're both shit and i'm misremembering uh, best scene 
from that movie in my opinion is uh where it just says like uh the end at the end of the movie and then i got to go home <laughs> agreed agreed um richard do you want to read out the next one um all right dante said another one i'd love to see avatar the last airbender this is happening sort of well okay then don't need to pitch it dante um because <laughs> we're getting more movies from the original creators but i love this world and i'd love to see how the world developed with bending and how it continues to develop one of my favorite things about Korra was that it was the avatar world's version of the 1920s and i thought it was so cool to see firebenders using lightning to power the city earthbenders using metal bending to be super crops and then you have aman and his movement take away bending it's such an interesting world i'd love to see more of it in any time period really just keep expanding that world all right there's not really a pitch in there <laughs> i've never i've never watched avatar so i um can't speak to it yeah i'm not i'm not too familiar with what he's talking about but i think there i i included it because we got a few that were like set in other universes so I, and this is the only one i've included because i thought it was interesting like what does a period piece look like when you take inspiration from real life and apply it to your fantasy Hmm. established fantasy world i guess have you seen avatar ben i have uh Hmm. and he's talking about uh legend of korra where they like Hmm. they jumped forward in time to like make it like steampunk and then uh Ah, right yeah and and it really was cool it was it was it was a lot of fun they're both very very good shows i'd highly recommend uh but like i i I do find that like super interesting when they do it like have you guys ever heard of brain sanderson yeah 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 okay fantasy author uh he has a series called mistborn where he did the exact same thing he has like the middle ages and then it it jumps forward to like the wild west and he's Mm. talked about how he's going to go into like modern day and then like space age and just like keep going with it and i just think that you know that's neat nice i once made up a, a word avalanche about brandon sanderson oh it was like it was so the setup was like um we're boycotting these uh, wristbands that were created by a famed fantasy author because uh, they've got sand in them. Um, or abandoned Brandon Sanderson, his branded bands have sand in them. So there's <laughs> there's the best piece of content you'll hear on this podcast. <laughs> Uh, the Almighty Watcher on Discord also said, um, a prequel saga on some kid in Hogwarts in the 1800s where they have annual Triwizard tournaments and a complete lack of bathrooms and safety protocols. Um, obviously referencing J.K. Rowling, letting the world know that wizards used to shit on the floor before toilets. Um, I think that, what is the Hogwarts Unleashed or whatever the game Hogwarts is? Legacy. Hogwarts Legacy. Isn't that set in the 1800s? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if there'll be toilets. <laughs> I wonder if like, disappearing your shit will be part of the game. <laughs> yeah, you have to learn the, the disappearing piss and shit spell. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that is the the probably the obvious way to take any further Harry Potter stuff. I don't think they want to go further into the future. I think you run into a lot more like logical problems if you have yeah. a modern day. Because you'd start Harry to Potter. have to have trans people. <laughs> yeah and tk rolling will not be having that. <laughs> um so i'm gonna read out my pitch now for, for you guys my pitch is called tentatively uh final destination 1888 um and so i am pitching a final destination prequel in which a series of ill-fated characters must outsmart death in the wild west of america this of course interestingly is technically not the first Final Destination period piece prequel because the twist at the end of Final Destination 5 is that it's actually a prequel to the first one and is set in 2000, but came out in like, what, 2012 or something? Yeah. So so you're pitching you're pitching a million ways to die in the West. I'm pitching it. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's what it should be called. <laughs> All right, here's my pitch. Uh, to celebrate the opening of their new saloon, a photo has been taken of its 10 owners standing outside the entrance. Now, a 10-way ownership is slightly unconventional for a business like a saloon, and certainly not without its internal drama, with certain partners believing others weren't needed to seal the deal. Uh, nonetheless, a fancy new camera, the camera's a relatively new invention, I looked it up, it's about 50 years old at this point, um, and a photographer snap pick for the local newspaper. But the flash from the bursting light 
light bulb spooks a nearby horse whose frantic and violent reaction breaks the shoddy carpentry of the saloon, causing it to collapse, killing the ten co-owners one by one as they're crushed by debris, decapitated by shards of wood. Maybe someone's set on fire because they're like drenched with alcohol and they have like a cigarette or a big block of ice falls on them what a good idea that's such a good idea oh i wish i thought of that for the actual (laughs) meat of the film (laughs) um this is of course just a premonition uh because one of the uh, it's a premonition from one of the 10 co-owners um a woman named caroline who is the young wife of a a wealthy It's a political film. And the young wife of a wealthy oil tycoon named Buck, who is also one of the owners, after Caroline snaps back to reality from her vision, moments before the photo is taken, she desperately attempts to stop it, explaining that the saloon is not safe and needs to be rebuilt. An argument ensues amongst the characters with a couple of people believing Caroline shouldn't even be on the deed, as she's only there because Buck lent her the money. Uh, Caroline manages to get six of the other co-workers away from the saloon, including Buck, before the photo is taken and of the remaining three owners and her premonition comes true. So three of them die instead of ten. The film plays out like other Final Destination movies as the seven survivors start getting killed off, this time set against the backdrop of the American frontier and the growing tension between the remaining seven owners, with questions raised about why the saloon was not set up to the standard they'd believed and how did Caroline even know it would collapse. After coming to believe death is chasing them and seeing the photo of the three now dead partners in the newspaper, the characters are able to determine death is coming from them in the order that they were standing in in that original post and they do their best to remember what order they were standing in here's what you're all here for here are the deaths the wild west theme finally final destination deaths that happen a cult who is a grizzled old barman is trying to drink away the trauma while shooting cans in the desert one one night his gun jams and he he like it will do a thing where he like looks into the barrel directly and you're like oh no because they always like ramp up the tension Mm. in final destination movies um but he actually ends up uh, smacking the gun and shooting himself in the foot by accident um he drunkenly attempts to get back on his horse to ride back into town to get help but he slips and trying to get up and twists the reins round his neck um he's found dead in the morning when his horse wanders back into town dragging his strangled body behind it Uh, There's also Duke, whose father was one of the three who died in the saloon collapse. He goes to get a rotten tooth pulled from a barber who doubles as a dentist, which I looked up, is actually what happened. Do you guys know that in the Wild West? (laughs) (laughs) You went to the barber for for dental work? Um, While Duke nearly chokes to death on one of the dentistry tools, or maybe some loose barber shears nearly cut his neck, or I wrote here, a stray cat nearly knocks a dentist drill into his eye. Um... He's he's eventually he's fine, you know the the procedure's fine. After after this, he um after he finishes his appointment with no injury other than the tooth being removed, he uses the dentist's outhouse where while taking a shit, he examines the locket his father gave him just before his death. Duke accidentally drops the locket, which falls into the long drop. Um, he gets up and leans in to try retrieve it, but falls in and the lid closes and he drowns in shit in complete darkness. Damn, the worst worst way to go, or is it? Maybe there are worse way to go. Uh, after <laughs> these survivors discover death's plan, Abner, the young, he's sort of like the nerdy character, um, he, he realizes he's next in line to die, so he concocts a crude potion made of blowfish venom, which can slow down his heart to such a slow rate to appear clinically dead, um, which he hopes will trick death into skipping him. While Abner slowly drifts into a temporary coma, however, Buck is attacked by fellow survivor Roscoe, who is convinced that buck is behind the shoddy workmanship of the saloon um and also believes he did this intentionally to collect like insurance payouts roscoe strings buck up by the neck and begins hanging him in the middle of town as caroline tries to stop him while roscoe pulls on the rope however it snaps freeing buck but causing roscoe to fall backwards into a man operating a steam-powered furnace causing him to over crank it exploding the top of the machine um the hot heavy metal plate flies into the air crashes into abner's house which is nearby, uh, but he's saved because the wooden beams of his roof hold back the metal plate. However, Abner is in a self-induced coma and slowly awakens just in time to see the metal plate burn through the wood and splatter his head. So, Roscoe, 
is next in line to die. He challenges Buck to a duel, believing if he kills Buck, death will skip him. At high noon, Roscoe pours the two of them a shot of whiskey, and the two begin to duel. On draw, the two men spin around and shoot. Buck is hit in the head and knocked back, while um, Roscoe is unscathed until the water tower Buck accidentally shot collapses and crushes Roscoe. Uh, both men are dead and Caroline is presumably safe as she was also being skipped being next in line after Buck after the funeral Caroline is mulling over Buck's mysterious death as the bullet had only grazed his skull it's believed he actually died of like shock more than wow. the bullet he actually. died of a broken heart um, yeah he's so <laughs> upset with being shot <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you do that <laughs> <laughs> um, that's when she discovers that the whiskey that Roscoe poured was in fact laced with Abner's blowfish venom Buck wakes up buried alive uh, oh. Caroline rushes to the cemetery in the middle of a rainstorm to dig up her husband before he suffocates when she opens the coffin Buck is mortified to see her because she should have let him die because now that he's alive it's her turn Caroline climbs out of the grave explaining there'll be another way to survive but she slips on the mud falling back into the grave snapping her neck Wow. Buck, who is still partially paralyzed due to the blowfish venom, um, drowns as rainwater fills up his coffin while his dead wife rests upon his body. Oof. While flashbacks tell us it was indeed him who skimmed, who skimped on the work to give the saloon strong foundations, and Roscoe's suspicions were actually entirely correct. Wow. That's Final Destination 1888. I do want to just point out none of those were worse than drowning in an outhouse. Yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> you think drowning in an outhouse is the worst one? Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's the one. Oh, that that's pe- okay. That's the tanning bed death that people, will, <laughs> you know, people are going to talk about that one. Mm, um, fair enough. That, that might be the worst way I can possibly think of to die. Like there, the there's the, certainly no, no, no. The poop, the, the, the like, poop. oh, the poop, of course. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's certainly more painful ways to die, but I think mm. that's the most like psychologically horrifying way to die mm. I can think of. Poop in your lungs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It is intrinsically old west as well, though. You know, people died that way all the time, right? In the cowboy days. Mm. <laughs> A lot of, lot of poop deaths. <laughs> I legitimately love this though. Like, here's the thing: I hate the final destination movies like mm-hmm. i do not enjoy them even a little bit fair and enough like if 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 you had just pitched that to me as in ben i just came back from the theater and here's what happens in this movie i would go buy a ticket immediately <laughs> like that i gotta that see this poop death <laughs> <laughs> like, that sounds like a genuinely great movie like not just oh, thanks, uh, a man. final destination movie Mm. well that's the thing with final destination is like none of the movies are that good but the concept's brilliant it's like they just Mm. haven't cracked it yet yeah um but yeah thank you very much richard do you want to read the next maybe couple of um suggestions we've got from fans give your uh give your voice a break please so mike noise said harold and kumar go to preschool the animated series I like how he doesn't specify the time period that this would take place what time period would it be like the 80s yeah, probably. Mm. Uh, FM Error on Twitter said, The nice guys, but it's a noir with the same actors and the same humor. Fast and Furious, but it's with carriages. Mm. Those are both fun ideas. Yeah, I think, I think, I wonder if the nice guys loses its edge by being set in an actual noir. By, by being anyway. actually a noir rather than a neo noir. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Fast and Furious, but with carriages, is one of a few Fast and Furious suggestions we got. Um, at Z Spicer ninety seven on Twitter said nineteen forties Fast and Furious, show me Scarface with all the ridiculous ridiculousness and cheese of a Fast and Furious movie, and bit more fermented teat nectar on uh, Discord said I don't have a plot, I just have a series of silly images in my head. Michelle Rodriguez zooming at a reasonable speed across cobblestone streets, honking those massive <laughs> comical horns. Um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> uh, the Rock and Vin in a bizarre, definitely not gay competition with each other trying to wind up their jalopies what's that word i don't know what that word is <laughs> jalopies um jason statham totaling his rat rod and grabbing a nearby horse with extreme acrobatics ludicrous inventing i don't know winter tires or something and tyrese gibson hitting on high society ladies without a single bit of slang changing <laughs> <laughs> And they're giving it a title as well, Fast and Furious, Turn of the Century. Turn of the Century, what do you guys think of that idea? Yeah, it's fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like it. 
the, a, a, a lot of these are like I wouldn't actually I don't think the film would be a good idea but uh, I did this the series of silly images is on like I, I'd, <laughs> I'd be fine with just like a, a, a folder of photoshopped images hmm Okay, I, no, I think <laughs> if you wanted to do the actual version of that movie that would work, it would have to be like racing horses that uh-huh. they're like breeding and like, you know, they, they go and they're robbing like the the dude who raises thoroughbreds like ranch mm. to yeah. wrestle a bunch of like prized Mustangs, yeah. you know. I mean, maybe this is a good place for Fast and Furious to go in the future. You like how um, the Archer series stopped doing oh, yeah. canonical <laughs> follow-up seasons and just set it in different places mm. like there's like a miami vice one and stuff yeah. like i wonder if that's where you go with fast and furious is just do standalone bottle episodes from mm. they call they're like called the past and the furious series the past and the furious <laughs> brilliant <laughs> Um, at Abigail 1963 on Twitter also said Drop Dead Gorgeous during the Salem Witch Trials. Do you know? Do you guys know the movie Drop Dead Gorgeous? I, I'm yeah. not really familiar with it. No, I'm, yeah. I I included it because I thought it was an original idea, and I th- it's like a um a beauty pageant movie. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's a good idea to set a beauty pageant movie during a the Salem Witch Trials. That's fun. Yeah, and it's like people just die mysteriously and stuff. Yeah, that, that's a cool. And the Salem Witch Trials is like ripe for film setting that's where the next prey movie should be should be a salem witch trial that should be the next predator movie (laughs) i like that i'm i'm personally a fan of uh the predator versus like either the aztecs or the spartans Mm. oh yeah what correct is an alien versus predator a movie i haven't seen in 20 years don't they fight aztecs in that or don't the aztecs worship them or some shit like that uh no they just like the the place where they keep the aliens is like a ziggurat like the ones that the aztec have but it's a ziggurat in like antarctica um but by that same token like it doesn't just have to be predator movies set in the past like Mm. alien versus predator movies set in the past (laughs) would be fantastic too (laughs) ziggurat i'm gonna remember that word for I'm going to save that word for later. <laughs> I bring it up on this podcast later. <laughs> it's it's the square pyramid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. They should call a movie Ziggurat. That, w- that would be a good title. <laughs> well, people are like, I'm not going to see it. What's a Ziggurat? Yeah, it sounds gross. <laughs> uh, Vincent Bay say, suggested Adam and Evangelion. 0.0, you cannot eat that apple, which is mm. um, a prequel to <laughs> Evangelion. Uh, we see the creation you're of You're laughing, humankind. Ben, which suggests you're familiar with, with Evangelion? Just the tiniest bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we see the creation of humankind. Lilith gives a precaution about the tree of knowledge, but uh, Eva, Eva is tempted by Koa, uh, Koaru to learn what their mighty god wants locked away. With the knowledge given by the fruit, Eva writes and creates the Dead Sea Scrolls and starts preparation for human instrumentality. AJ, can you just like explain to me what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? I don't. I can't remember. It's, it's been a long time since Sunday school. <laughs> ben, do you know? I do know. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, a collection of scrolls uh, that were perfectly preserved from like thousands of years ago. That's like half the old Testament. Um, right. and it was this big find because, you know, people didn't know how old the Bible was. And right. after that, they were like, Oh, cool. It's at least like blank, like 6,000 right. years old. I don't remember the actual number. Is that what it is in Evangelion or is it a different thing in Evangelion? <laughs> it's very different. I don't know what on earth that has to do with Evangelion. <laughs> I think maybe I I don't know are they I don't know they they're, they're part of it um they are part of the Ava. okay um, Ava lore. but do people like the Dead Sea Scrolls or are they good or uh, bad the, the, it's just the Bible like it's just do people old like and, so it has its fans but uh, <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> like, how how many Christians slash uh, followers of Judaism are there like so it's, it's got a fairly sizable fandom. Mm, that's true fandom <laughs> <laughs> one of the most toxic fandoms <laughs> um Ty- at tyler metallica on uh twitter um also just a- apropos of nothing replied to the tweet and said crappy 2010s flubber which is like god that's so funny what does he mean <laughs> <Why> flubber? 
<laughs> what what time period is the twenty tens? It's such a like I don't know what he meant, but he, there's one of his suggestions. <laughs> awesome. Hey Ben, can you let us know what your pitch is? Uh sure. Um so I uh I had a few ideas, but the one I decided to go with, uh, because it kind of just fit with the theme so well, mm. is uh Terminator Dark Ages. Oh, where it's, oh, I it's, love this so much. It's so good. Um, basically, I, I don't have it nearly as detailed as AJ, so apologies That's okay. there. Oh, no, um, <laughs> I well, well, well. Now I feel like I'm like, okay, you, you guys talk. Give me a minute. I got to write. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Richard won't have done, will have done less than you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the gist of it uh, would be okay. So. It, it, it's very obvious that if you just put a Terminator movie in the Middle Ages, like that would just be awesome right off the bat because, mm. like, there's you know, you can't stop a Terminator with like guns, but mm. at least you can like slow it down. There's like yeah, yeah. nothing you can do awesome. to like kill a Terminator in the Middle Ages. Um, but then I was like, okay, what if you take like the concept? Uh, e- even a step further than that and made it even more of a subversion of Terminator. And instead of your typical Terminator movie where a Terminator is sent back in time to kill an ancestor of, uh, you know, John Connor, mm. what if it's the other way around and the humans are like, yo, let's totally surprise the Terminators. <laughs> we'll go so far back. They don't even like think about it. And we're going to go to the middle ages, find the guy who's the great, 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 great grandpa of the guy who design skynet and we'll mm. kill them in the middle ages where they're just totally not expecting it so like nice. the humans send like a kill squad back to the middle ages they think this is going to be easy peasy but yeah. turns out the guy they're going to kill is like this ri- like a king or a lord who's got like a whole army and on top of that the terminators did see this coming and they've sent like <laughs> two terminators back in time to be this dude's bodyguards mm. and so you've got like this whole thing where these like you know think almost like the the squad from the original predator movie these like ultra awesome soldiers have to like try and kill this one guy and get through all these people and then you could even throw in like a little bit of a moral dilemma where like maybe he realizes oh hey you know this guy actually isn't half bad there's like the only decent king around who treats (laughs) his peasants really nice and so then it's like well do we actually want to kill this Mm. guy and yeah i i just feel you like you could turn it into just this gonzo mashup of genres i think that's great and i think regardless of the time period flipping the original terminator stakes around is really interesting that that the main characters are the ones that have gone to kill uh, an ancestor now i think that yeah i think that's really great um what what do you got should we workshop some like medieval like fun that could happen with a terminator trebuchet yeah, yeah that, that was one i thought like like you could either have the trebuchet be like the way they finally kill them but i think it would be a lot better if like it's one of those fake out moments like with the nitrogen from uh t2 where mm-hmm. you think oh cool they killed them because they got him in the perfect spot for the trebuchet and the trebuchet like just nailed the terminator with this mm-hmm. giant boulder and then the Terminator just like gets up from underneath the boulder and just chucks the boulder aside, and it's like That's crap. crap. That's awesome. I could see a Terminator walking stony face through the moat of the, around the mm-hmm. castle. And oh, the oh, that's great! Oh, <laughs> I, I had one great idea last night when when I was really tired and and I was I think I was having a nightmare. Um, but uh, <laughs> so you know they pour like the hot oil over the sides. Like mm-hmm. you've got a Terminator crawling up the side. Oh hell yeah! Uh, right and they pour the hot oil over it and it's just this horrifyingly gory thing where the human flesh is just dissolving mm. off of the you terminator have to have a shot like that in a terminator film with the yeah, yeah exactly but usually it's like off screen it's like there's an explosion and then there's you know skeleton mm. like i'm like imagining just like the skin just like slowly like burning and off his, of it his unscathed mental state like it doesn't stop him from oh, oh, yeah it's terrifying oh. him Oh my like the God. really dark looking terminator from mm-hmm. terminator dark fate mm-hmm. uh with like the black metal like that could just be mm-hmm. uh, like like and everyone thinks like 
that it's like of religious significance that these are yeah, like demons yeah, yeah. um that, oh, that are coming around and- god this is so <laughs> obvious why are they making Terminator movies anything but this? Hire me, Fox. I wonder. I do wonder if Prey will actually slight that spark mm. that we've been talking about. I wonder if you like because the obvious ones I think are Terminator and Alien. Feel like the obvious mm. ones to do the Prey treatment with. Mm. I wonder if we actually will legitimately see this because it's so such an obvious and and like. There's so many opportunities, you know. Of yeah, since your idea was so obvious, Ben. No, no, I didn't. Think <laughs> it's a compliment. It's a compliment. <laughs> I thought it was unique. <laughs> it is unique. That's what I'm saying. Um, Luke on the Discord says, uh, uh, "From dusk till dawn, prequel set in Prohibition. I want to throw vampires at the period piece, and with how they are used to counter the human criminal element in the first flick, it makes sense to me that they would have prevalence or at least a compelling story in that setting slash time." Again, interestingly, from memory when we covered yeah. it on the podcast, From Dust Till Dawn 3 is a Western. It mm. is a period piece. But, I mean, Prohibition is a great era to, to set a vampire thing in. Yeah. Oh, that's so great, especially because you could do a thing with the whole, like, illegal alcohol thing. Like, you yeah, could yeah. have, like, you know, it's Elliot Ness, and he's tracking down this dude who's, like, you know, funneling all this illegal alcohol, and then he like cracks open a bottle and it's blood and he's mm. like what on mm. earth is this <laughs> that's so cool there better not be alcohol oh it's blood okay <laughs> <laughs> um a pro a prohibition alcohol movie would be uh, pro- sorry prohibition vampire movie mm. would be cool anyway so uh Huberdu said john wick prequel about the founding of the continental could be read wiki says it was founded in 1904 so it could be set in the political build up to world war one or maybe after it's founded there's a bunch of competing agencies with that same backdrop again this feels like one that's like this is just a matter of time surely like mm, surely you don't mm. set it in 1904 without planning to do something yeah. with it in the future and um, they and they right- love world building john wick no matter how they much, lo- it, they no matter how much of- it, you know, ruins the mystique of the original. They love adding <laughs> world building. <laughs> Uh, Ryan from Florida on Discord said, I don't like the idea of a Back to the Future sequel or midquel, but this is just in the spirit of the pitch. He says, how about a Back to the Future midquel or prequel where Doc and Marty get stuck back in the either of the dates he entered when he showed Marty the DeLorean. When he was showing how the time circuit wor- circuits worked, he punched in signing of the Declaration of Independence, which is uh, the 7th of the 4th, 1776. Um, he also the punched in of Birth of Christ... Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. Uh, birth, birth of Christ on the twenty fifth of the twelfth, uh, zero 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 zero, which I don't think was actually the birth of Christ. I don't know where that would send you. Um, probably a rehash of three being stuck in the past like that, but it could be a fun idea for a canon reason to being stuck in one of those time periods. Yeah, I think um, the again, like, this is the, this is the series. Yeah, this is the animated <laughs> this- series. This is the animated series. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did you know that, um, Ben, uh, the first episode of the animated series sees Mm. Marty McFly, one of the greatest protagonists in the history of film, uh, fighting for the Confederacy in the Civil War? Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very strange idea. Like, even just, like, in terms of, like, pulp, fun theme time periods to go back to the civil war is such a strange <laughs> kickoff point like your first one should be pirates right it shouldn't be the civil war well okay okay real quick so just awesome. just as a quick caveat <laughs> to that mm. um so i live in the american south and mm. and we have this thing here i don't know if you guys are overly familiar with it uh, where they do s- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do you guys have racism in New Zealand? Is, is that uh, did yes, we yes no did we, we import that? <laughs> um, that that's one of our best exports. Um, but uh, no, nah, that's Britain's export. Uh, anyway, but, <laughs> yeah, we'll put it on them. <laughs> they started it. Um, anyway, but the uh, it, there's civil war reenactments yeah, where yeah. like people will just you know dress up as on, on both sides people will be like oh yeah we're confederates and oh we're union and they'll like shoot at each other um and when i heard about prey i very briefly entertained the idea of doing like a fan film where it's the predator in the civil war and just going to one of those reenactments and shooting like b-roll and then having like one soldier get lost in the woods 
woods mm. Mm. and then he goes head to head with a predator after and i was like oh this is a great way to get like free production value. <laughs> um, that's a good idea the, yeah they're interesting those civil war reenactments because it's like I, I mean, it was pretty fucked up but um <laughs> But I, I like yeah. just the idea of getting dressed up in old timey costumes and doing like a fun little reenactment is like, yeah, it's like it's it's you know it's just it's larping. Hmm. I don't know if I was a Civil War soldier and I found out this was going to happen two hundred years later, I'd be so pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> like defining trauma of my life, and now you're like getting your suit dry cleaned. <laughs> 300 of my brothers died in that battle <laughs> and you are making it into make-believe <laughs> um, Greg from the Kingdom of Sleep on Discord said uh, I would love a The Godfather set in Renaissance Sicily about the crime families of Corleone Mafia families go back a long way and the Renaissance lends well not coincidentally to the mixture of opulence and grime that define gangster movies it's not difficult to imagine a decadent feast or an opera intercut with violent murders similar to the baptism scene for example this is one of these ideas that people said this was like it's probably too good for <laughs> it's probably too genuinely good of an idea for our silly little show yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really intelligent um, idea. To I wouldn't be surprised if I know. I feel like The Godfather has somehow evaded being franchised to death, mm. so maybe something like this wouldn't happen. But mm. it's a good idea. Uh, at in increments has said, I'd like to see some Star Wars movies set around the Clone Wars. We hear Obi Wan talk about in A New Hope. Now they've done something very funny and very <laughs> silly here. <laughs> is that they have pretended that some movies that do exist don't exist mm. very very funny. cool very funny that's almost as original <laughs> as ben's idea <laughs> <laughs> uh, at z spicer 97 says medieval oceans 11 doesn't necessarily have to be an oceans movie but i do think a heist movie set in medieval times is a great twist on the genre that's rarely seen limitations breed creativity so it would be refreshing to to not see magical tech solve all the problems what's up ben? okay so i <laughs> this was what i was ben going put to his pitch hand up for those who <laughs> yeah <laughs> Just, just want to be noticed. Um, this was one of my ideas, and then I realized that's just the perfect Robin Hood movie. Mm. I guess, it, uh, yeah, it would yeah. be. Nice. Robin's Eleven. I'd call it Robin's yeah. Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> you could do, like, uh, Ocean's Eleven in, like, the Stone Age, and just, like, Oonga Boonga, you know? Like, yeah. Ooga Booga's the, Eleven. The exact same, yeah. <laughs> but Eleven is just Eleven Dashes in the title. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> <account. laughs> Um, Richard, do you want to tell us your pitch? Yeah, so I, I have a few, like, sort of ones. But because the thing with I find with these period piece prequels is that there's one quite obvious way, one to do, and that's what we've been talking about for years, that take a horror villain or a horror scenario, put it in olden times. Because any movie you see nowadays, any modern horror movie, they have to oh the cell phones don't work in here or something like that so it's like you just take it to a time before any of that technology existed and immediately the stakes are higher the one that interested me the most was the idea of taking um nightmare on elm street back mm. in time uh one thought i had was that you could take it back to because there's this interesting phenomenon where people who sort of came of age when um black and white television was a thing that they dream in black and white but before mm. that there's no record of people dreaming black and white and after that as well and so you know that's like a, a fun sort of and you know character like freddy krueger can have fun with this but the other idea has that, like take us take the concept of freddy krueger so far back in time to uh before there was like a actual like language before language was invented and mm. how freddy krueger can like intimidate and scare people and kill them in their dreams without having language yeah. to like you know rely on the nightmare a nightmare before elm street yeah um a nightmare on elm cave oh <laughs> <laughs> um but my other idea is so, so that's like the horror one but the other idea that i have is 
like so i I talk i talk about horrible bosses a lot as my example for this that it's like you have this great trio of jason sudeikis charlie day and jason bateman and then you make horrible bosses it's a lot of fun they've got great chemistry and then you go oh well we want more let's do horrible bosses too and i always say you don't have to make horrible bosses too you could have just made another movie starring those three and but I thought, well, what about you find movies with these like great comedy casts and instead of doing a sequel to the film, do this the first film over again in a different time period. What if the you made a horrible bosses prequel where they work for the most horrible boss in history, Adolf Hitler? <laughs> <laughs> and like, so you have these guys, but and, and like embrace the like anachronism like anachronosity of it that you know they're not necessarily like they're from our time and they're transported back but have them still talk reasonably like modern-esque and you know make jokes about how things have changed but the the other thing is um some other ideas were uh take anchorman back to the era of like mccarthyism Mm. Um, with that same cast but the one that i that i settled on as being like my favorite <laughs> it's, it's, one for listeners at home ben is losing his shit listening to richard's ideas he's <laughs> laughing silently so i don't know if it's getting picked up time, but he is like in tears laughing at these ideas i'm trying not to interrupt <laughs> no, interrupt oh with gosh. laughter it's good podcasting <laughs> what well, the, the other idea i had because i, I was trying to think of like movies or like time periods that interest me and none really uh, the, the most obvious one would be world war Two, and then i came out with anne frank's diary of a wimpy kid um <laughs> <laughs> or the the, the the diary of wimpy anne frank or something yeah the, the most offensive adjective you could describe anne frank with. <laughs> <laughs> but uh the idea that i think that i would genuinely want to see and this is a, a film that gets a lot of flack for being the sequel being the same thing over again. What if instead of The Hangover Part 2, we got a Hangover movie set in Prohibition era? Ah, brilliant. <laughs> oh, that writes itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Alan has like smuggled some alcohol to them. And so then you have this whole one of them goes missing but there's this whole thing on the 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 day the had the hangover day where they also like can't give away the fact that they were drunk last night or had uh you, you know that they're hung over now mm. um so that's my pitch is the and they're they're in trouble with like the gangsters yeah you know they're in trouble with al capone and stuff like that's that's mm. the antagonistic force yeah yeah well, well it, it, it would be Al Capone and like Elliot Ness. Elliot Ness is like, wait, <laughs> hold on. You people had drinks. Yeah. Where did you get them from? Yeah, yeah they, exactly. they, so they it's, pitched it's, them from Al Capone. It's pressure from, from both sides. It's a legitimately good idea for a film, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> we should call us Hollywood. Like, we've got... <laughs> Like you can have all these for cheap, I promise. Like, <laughs> the, the Hangover Part Zero, because it's set yeah, yeah. But you'd have like one. the yeah, like Ed Helms's character would be real reluctant to have the alcohol because he also break the law, hmm. or something like that. But yeah, like just take good comedy casts and make another movie with this more or less the same plot. Yeah. Here's how it opens. We 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 open on a sweaty uh bradley cooper who still looks incredible we, he still he looks incredible <laughs> we pan out and he's like lying he's, he's you know obviously they've had the hangover he gets up he stumbles over to a gramophone <laughs> he calls someone they're like hello and he's like we did it again that's, <laughs> that's how the movie starts that, like that, that's not what a gramophone is isn't it a gramophone's no. a record player <laughs> Oh, what's the little, like, old-timey telephone? He stumbles to a gramophone. He's like, we committed to this. He's so hungover, he walks over to a, to a record player and goes, we did it. Again. Yeah, the, the one with the, the big horn. <laughs> Stalking into the horn. It writes itself. Well, that's awesome. And they, they run um, into, like, um, I don't know, like, Rocky Marciano or something was he around at that time. Um, you know, instead of Mike Tyson. Oh right, yeah, yeah, nah, yeah. No, he yeah, was yeah. he nice. was way way after that. Nineteen twenties boxes. Uh, Gene Tunney. Fantastic! I'm sure people will recognize that name when it comes yeah. up. Yeah. Um, 
the the final uh, entry we've got from from the Discord is from Bliss My Man Borg, who has um, followed up with a couple months back. We did um, just a sequel pitching competition, and he won with this awesome Austin Powers four pitch. Um, so he's pitched us Austin Powers, a fifth Austin Powers film. Um, it's a prequel called Doctor Year Baby. <laughs> um, he says this: we follow a young Austin Powers casting suggestion, Finn Wolfhard, who was recently drafted into world war ii immediately upon turning 16 he fumbles his way through training and winds up succeeding as as, as, at seeking top intel from nazi spies upon returning home he is immediately flung into the raw sexual fury that is the start of the baby boom although women are throwing themselves at him as they always did he struggles in the aftermath of the war due to some implied trauma a few years pass it pass and he he is he accepts and graduates from the british intelligence academy and he finds out the british intelligence wants him to and wants him to spy he accepts his former classmates and established a gold member as established in gold member include basil exposition dr evil and no- number two and austin himself they are being sent on a mission to recover a mysterious relic in, in, in zimbabwe they are joined by a sexy guide na- named peggy myaz um <laughs> evil and austin are both are both smith with they find a last ditch group of german soldiers that are planning to steal a mysterious artifact from an ancient temple that will give the germans a unheard of power that's a brief scene where germans explains that they are not nazis but are still evil <laughs> <laughs> it's such an Austin Powers kind of scene. Um, however, Evil and Number Two betray Austin, Basil, and Peggy, and team up with the Germans. Eventually, Austin and Co catch up to Evil, and the relic is revealed to be an ancient artifact that bestows a power known as Mojo to whoever uses it. After a battle, Doctor Evil appears to activate the Mojo and is gaining the power, but Austin defeats him. Although briefly tempted by the by the relic, Austin decides not to use it. Austin returns home and is named a knight and receives an honorary doctorate from the British intelligence intelligence academy for his actions he gives the he is given the relic and is told that he may use it as he sees fit He he shrugs and goes off to have fun with peggy the film ends with peggy disappointed asking dr austin why he doesn't use the relic austin doesn't explain and turns on the tv to see the rhythmic thrusts of elvis on television he smiles looks at the relic back at the camera and winks and whispers yeah baby post credit scene mike myers austin is talking to basil and they discuss their graduation from the academy with austin insisting that they graduated in 1958 basil corrects him says it was 1948 stating he often misremembers these things they both look at the camera and say happy referring to the fact that gold member city graduated in 58 <laughs> nice um my only issue with this is that um uh zimbabwe wasn't called zimbabwe until the 60s so well maybe that can be acknowledged as well <laughs> that's a very austin <laughs> powersy joke as well that, that's very oh, austin but it's just like we know it wasn't zimbabwe mm. but <laughs> yeah. we were yeah. too lazy to look it up <laughs> yeah I, I or, think, or, or like Google doesn't exist yet either. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if only there was some way to look this up easily. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> nice, nice work, everybody. And I think that these are some great ideas and a fun exploration of the concept. Um, and yeah, that's that's all we've got. So, um, uh, Ben, what is Center Row or ben, anything else? Ben, who like are you? <laughs> who the hell are you? <laughs> who do you think you are? <laughs> uh thanks for having me guys i really appreciate it uh you can find me uh on youtube i've got a small youtube channel called cinero where i just talk about movies kind of like this i have a series called film fix where i basically just take movies that were good but not great and like mm. pitch just like oh what if you did this and you yeah, know yeah. try and make them better and uh and so yeah you know check out center row um got a lot of i I haven't been updating it a lot recently but uh i've got a lot of great stuff on there that i'm really proud of and hopefully i'll start Mm. uh updating it again yeah yeah um for cole popcher youtube channel fans if there are any still out there um you probably will have seen uh ben a few times he was involved in the director project we did a couple years back as well as i guest starred on his tenet sound design uh video so yeah 
f- familiar <laughs> familiar faces. Um, yeah, thank you for coming on the show, Ben. If you want to uh, support Cole Popshire, listeners at home, not you specifically, Ben, though you are welcome to. Um, there is, of course, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Cole Popshire. You can also join our Discord, uh, where we got a lot of these responses from. That's down in the show notes. And if you would like to uh, donate, we do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Cole Popshire, where you get to do all sorts of things like suggest which movies we watch, and you also get to give us a post credit scene, which is a, a little question we'll answer from a fan after the outro music plays ben you're welcome to stay and answer the the post credit scene as well um but yeah let us know in the comments everyone your tell us more ideas this is a topic which fascinates me endlessly and i would love to hear i, I love hearing like like i feel like everyone's brought like a such a crisp good idea to the table for this episode <laughs> so i really love hearing when it when it just it's just right the um the hot oil on the terminator thing has to happen it has to happen. <laughs> what a brilliant what a brilliant scene um but yeah thank you everybody and we'll uh catch you next week for coming to america and coming to america <sighs> the next franchise we're doing all right, welcome everybody to the post credit scene. This is a segment at the end of each episode where if you donate $5 or more over at patreon.com slash you get to give us something to talk about in this, the post credit scene. Richard, do you have the Google I do. sheet open? Who's it from and what is it? This ben one is still here, by the way, everyone. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> Hello. This comes to us uh, from Jeremy G- Gascoin, who says, do mm-hmm. either of you or any of you have any truly original ideas that you feel you want to make in the future <laughs> that could possibly be considered a magnum opus? I- yeah, i got this idea about this this medieval Terminator. And this, like, <laughs> Um, I think like I have plenty of ideas kicking around, but I think I, I I don't think any of my ideas could be construed as truly original. <laughs> I don't I don't think any ideas can be. I don't I don't think the la- I can't remember the last time I saw something that mm. I would describe as truly original. No. Maybe everything ever no. was. <laughs> which wasn't that yeah. long ago but before but even, that it was that's a long time. that original. That's like banking off the like multiverse trend from what's been going around true. For, like 20 years um okay well uh, i've got uh, i've always like when i was a kid i used to make up video games um mm. and i've st- there i have a few video game ideas which like well, there's one in particular which i feel like i shouldn't go into because it's my intellectual property mm. there's one in particular that if i died without making this game i feel like my life would feel mm. incomplete i've got no idea how to make a game so this is like a long-term yeah. life goal and at least you um, always have uh, inside by play dead oh yeah the game which is very similar to the game that i came up with that's right everybody i and i alone came up with the incredibly original idea of a side-scrolling video game set in this dark world where you play as a little boy or creature or robot and there's like puzzles to solve this is my favorite overly, type of overly game. gory deaths overly gory deaths this is my favorite type of game and there's so fucking many of them mm. um i'm a i'm a child of odd world i'm a i'm an abe's odyssey kid so you're an odd boy I'm an odd boy. Ben, what about you? Do you want to share any of your... <laughs> Imagine those, like, we get you on our podcast just so you can tell us your, like, amazing film <laughs> ideas. I, I'm i like, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. I've written, like, six screenplays. Wow. Like, oh. And those, those aren't even, like, the stuff that I really want to do. That's just, like, what I started out on. Hmm. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you one. Um, are you guys familiar... Uh, like ultimately, what what if you know all my dreams came true? What mm-hmm. I want to do is like write and direct like fantasy and sci fi movies, sure, right? Yeah. Like you know, I I want to I want to do like Steven Spielberg kind of stuff. But um, me and a friend of mine, I was sitting around with her, and I was like, man, I, I really wish I had a great idea for a horror movie. Mm. But there isn't a lot of stuff that scares me, so I haven't really had any good ideas for horror movies. Um, and um, and the things that do scare me are like existential things that don't that don't translate, don't translate into horror. It's like, what if I don't achieve my dreams? Yeah. The horror movie. Like, <laughs> um, and she jokingly said, "Oh, what about incels?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh." Uh, <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's funny. Where would that go? Um, and she's like, oh, what about uh, what about like uh, something like this? And I'm like, ooh. Ooh, and what about this? Mm. She's like, oh, what about this? Beautiful. And then we went out to to dinner at a Mexican restaurant and we hashed out the whole thing. We wrote it. Um, awesome. I'm on like the fifth draft of it. Like we even looked, have been looking into maybe like 
independently making it. But it's basically like get out. But instead of racists, it's incels. Is, is the long and short of it. What a great idea. That's so good. Um, if you ever need someone to play the incel, <laughs> I'm sure I could probably pull that off. 